Welcome. In this lecture, I will take you on a journey through the history of time, development and application of seismic design codes around the world. The destructive effect of earthquakes on buildings has been recorded from ancient times, but engineering understanding of the phenomena and means to control damage only started to develop within the past 100 years. No well-known documented scientific knowledge was available to help San Francisco rebuild more safely after the great earthquake of 1906. There was negligible seismic design codification before 1940, and early guidance was limited to the provision of minimum lateral requirements based on judgment rather than well-known facts. Progress accelerated with the advent of digital computing in the 1960s and 1970s, which enabled for the first time the dynamic characteristics of recorded ground motions and their effect on structural systems to be studied systematically. The precursors of our modern seismic codes emerged in the 1960s, embodying the philosophy that it is generally not economical to construct normal buildings to survive large earthquakes without damage, and whilst incurring damage, buildings should be designed to prevent collapse. Lateral design forces were specified, lower than expected maximum elastic force demands, in the belief that structural ductility would protect against collapse. As a typical example, the 1980, 1994 Uniform Building Code lists numerous structural systems, their permitted force reduction factor and building height limits. Numerous restrictions on regularity, structural detailing have evolved over the years in an attempt to ensure that the ductile behavior assumed was achieved. Current international design codes retain the same principles for most buildings. They are force-based defining design forces based on elastic seismic demand reduced by a factor related to the ductility of the overall structural system. Since force demands are generally established by elastic analysis, this approach is accessible to structural engineers using conventional analysis methods. Improvements in code provisions are driven largely by learning from major earthquakes around the world. For example, the 1985 Mexico City earthquake highlighted the importance of soil response. The Northridge earthquake of 1994 showed that the steel moment frames, which had been believed to be highly ductile, were susceptible to brittle fracture. Alternatives to the force-based philosophy emerged in the 1990s based around concepts called performance-based design and displacement-based design. The performance-based movement stemmed from two concerns, brought into focus by the high economic losses in the earthquakes in Kobe and Northridge in the mid-90s. Firstly, maybe objectives other than preventing collapse were important. For example, damage control to reduce economic loss, particularly for important buildings and infrastructure. Secondly, how does one assess older buildings not complying with modern seismic provisions? This movement developed the concept of performance objectives and the idea that multiple objectives might apply depending on the reality of the supposed seismic event and the required post-earthquake functionality. Displacement-based design grew from the observation that fundamentally Seismic actions are dynamic displacements imposed by the ground, not imposed dynamic forces that act on structures. A low strength ductile structure will experience the same maximum deformations as a stronger, nearly elastic structure. The low strength ductile structure yields at a smaller displacement and it will continue to support the weight of a building during ongoing deformation demands. Earthquakes are accidental loads. An analogy would be a car crash, in which significant permanent deformations may occur. Therefore, it makes intuitively sense to assess the structural behavior of a building by calculating the expected deformations that
that may be imposed on a building from an earthquake and the tolerance of the structural and non-structural members to be able to safely accommodate the imposed deformations rather than forces and strength in our calculations. Criteria in modern performance-based design are permissible inelastic deformation, not strength, based on the tolerance of components to continue to carry loads whilst at the same time being deformed. How much cyclic deformation can a structural element accommodate before it loses its ability to carry load? The engineer must adopt nonlinear analysis, which is more complex than linear analysis. The most widely applicable method is nonlinear response history analysis, which is now mandatory in certain jurisdictions for the assessment of special structures, including high rise buildings. Static, nonlinear pushover analysis can be used for structures which are reasonably represented as single degree of freedom systems. In the developing world, there is still much to do to ensure that basic standards of collapse prevention are realized. However, in developed economies, the interest is moving towards resilience or the ability to recover rapidly after an earthquake event. The problem is well illustrated by the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake sequence in New Zealand. The building stock performed well against conventional criteria. Very few buildings collapsed and there were few fatalities. However, damage was such that many buildings could not be reoccupied. 65 to 70 percent of buildings in the central business district of Christchurch were demolished as they were uneconomical to repair, and the whole central business district was inaccessible as a safety hazard for a number of years. Resilience-based design aims to limit damage such that buildings can be occupied and be functional in a short time frame after a major event. New buildings can be designed to meet low damage targets at a small cost premium using modern seismic protection technologies. The seismically isolated San Francisco General Hospital is designed to remain operational after a large earthquake. Many of us believe that this type of objective is worth pursuing for most new buildings. In the next two lectures of this series, more in-depth knowledge will be given on the European Seismic Code, Eurocode 8, and the first Dutch practical guideline for induced seismic seismicity in Groningen, NPR 9998. Thank you.